Hey everybody, Mr. JK here, and yeah, I'm sorry, it's been a minute since I recorded. Nobody cares! I'm an idiot, anyways. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna be uh, react to a video today, and guess what, guys? A new fat electrician video just dropped. So, we're gonna be reacting to it. Uh, this one's basically, basically almost dang near an hour long, so yeah, anyways, uh... I'm not going to bore you with any more details. I'm just going to get straight to it. The biggest airborne mission of all time is Operation Market Garden when over 41,000 Allied paratroopers jumped into the Netherlands. The most famous airborne operation of all time is probably the jump into Normandy for D-Day. But the most perfect and textbook example of what an airborne operation could and should be is one that you've probably never even heard of. Okay, I'm lighting. Today we're talking about the only airborne division assigned to the Pacific Theater of World War II, the 11th Airborne, and their incredible raid on the Los Banos prison camp. And we're going to get to it right after a word from our sponsor. This video okay. is brought to you by Delete Me. Finally, okay. No, stop. What are you doing? What are you doing? Wh I need you to go a mile away and put an apple on your head so I have an alibi for this. Nicholas. What? <sighs> Rude. All right, I'm going to go do my nails since we're switching roles today. Why are you leaving your gun on the couch? That way it's a tax write-off. You'd know that if you knew how to do my job. I could do his job better. <laughs> I can do this. Yeah, I'd rather go shopping. Did that go the way you thought it was gonna go? Nope. Nick! I'm doing your job! Always easy until you're the one that actually has to do it. Anyways, this video is brought to you by Delete Me. All right, here's the deal. It's pretty straightforward. It's an online subscription service. You give them money, they turn around and make sure that all in your personal information. These data brokers are legally required to delete your information if you submit an opt-out request. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of different data brokers. Sorry. They all accept opt-out requests a bunch of different ways, and they make it as hard as humanly possible. But when you have Delete Me, not really they figure this. out which data brokers have your information, they automatically submit opt-out requests so that they have to delete it, and then they continue to monitor those same data brokers in case they somehow get your information again. I actually like Delete Me so much that I upgraded to the family plan and I'm now getting all my wife's information taken off the internet as well. So if you wanted to give it a try too, I'm gonna have a link and a discount code down below that's gonna save you 20%. Let's get back to the video. That's a bad news. All right, important background info. December 7th, 1941, the Japanese commit the <laughs> ultimate sin of fucking with America's boats when they attack Pearl Harbor. <laughs> yeah. Don't touch the boats. You understand? Don't go in there. Don't People are familiar with this. However, most people don't realize that immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese launched attacks all throughout the Pacific. Among the many places attacked was the Philippines, which if you don't know at this point in time was an American colony that America had acquired after the Spanish-American War in 1898. So because of that, there's both American and Filipino military there. However, there simply isn't enough of them and they are completely overrun by the Japanese military. After several weeks, it becomes very- I believe this was in one of his other stories about, uh... Jesus Christ, I might as well just put the fucking loading symbol on my head. What well, I'm thinking, this is a video about uh, one of, I forgot who it is, but I have to look back and see clear to the US military and the Filipino government that they are probably not going to be able to defend. I probably put it on the video. Sorry about that. And the capital of Manila from the Japanese, if it comes to that. So they have two options. They can A, decide to fight it out there anyways and make it as painful as possible to the Japanese, make them fight block by block, brick by brick, house by house, build. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on for a sec. Hold on a sec. Uh, through the power of editing. There we go. We switch sides. Back to the video building by building and make it a horrific bloody affair or B they can agree to simply leave Manila intact completely declaring it an open city and allowing the Japanese to take it over without a fight hopefully preserving the city and as many civilians as possible which is exactly what they decide to do on December 26th 1941. Really? Okay, but here's the problem with that. Remember, the Philippines is an American colony and Manila is the big, beautiful city capital. So because of that, there's a ton of Americans that live there, most mm. of which are just living there in some temporary <clears throat> professional capacity. There's doctors, teachers, nurses, diplomats, business people. There's also a bunch of representation from the Catholic Church and a lot of the priests and nuns happen to be American. Regardless, there is a ton of American citizens that are left behind in Manila when the Japanese take over. Because of this, the Japanese decide that they're going to take the local college, Santo Tomas University, they are going to convert it into an internment camp and stick all of the Americans inside of it. While the Americans did make up the majority of the camp, there were some British, French, Polish uh, 
people from Spain, Mexico, mm. Canada, pretty much any other person that the Japanese could look at and go, hey, you're not from here. And they stuck him in Santo Tomas as well. Mm. So that's horrible news, and the only kind of silver lining they have is that these are not POWs, these are civilian internees, which the Japanese looked at a little bit different. You see, the Japanese still believed in this Bushido code of honor where if you surrendered on the battlefield, you basically forfeit your human rights, and you were subhuman, and they could do whatever they wanted to you. They looked at civilian internees a little bit different. These weren't warriors that surrendered on the battlefield and had lost their honor. This was primarily elderly men, women, and children. So they were treated slightly more charitable than POWs, but it still was not a great i'd imagine slightly it's still not yeah it's still not great well this sucks that's still not great this extra consideration for them being civilians varied from camp to camp, from place to place, because they had civilian internment camps all over the world. So every camp was very different. The Japanese had no standard operating procedures for how they treated their civilian internees or their POWs. You were very much at the will of whoever the Japanese officer in charge was. And in the case of Santo Tomas, it was actually one of the better ones to be at. Bear in mind, I'm not saying it was good. Nobody was having a good time. Still a horrible place to be. But on the scale or the spectrum of being in a Japanese internment or POW camp, this was one of the better ones, which at the end of the day isn't saying a whole lot. <laughs> now, the yeah, reason it was, was better was because the I Japanese was just about to say, that's not saying a lot had like a real loose control of it basically they put a fence up told all the americans to stay inside the fence and we're going to bring you food if you try to escape we'll kill you that was pretty much how it went down they allowed the filipino people the civilians to bring the americans extra food the filipino people were great to the american internees as much as they could be they tried to deliver their mail they were trying to give them anything and everything they possibly could and the japanese allowed that to happen so that's what kind of made it more tolerable than a lot of other camps but as world war ii progressed in the Japanese Empire got weaker and weaker. Conditions in the internment camp and really all of Manila as a whole got worse. Supply lines oh. broke down. Bullshit. Not good. Now, Manila is a big city. You have to bring in a ton of supplies to sustain a city. So not only did the Japanese military not have enough resources to divert to this internee camp, but the Filipino civilians weren't able to give as much either, leading to way worse conditions. It was overcrowded. There wasn't enough food to go around. So the main problem is, is they can't get the food from the farms into the city. So what if we take the internees and move them out of the city and just put them on the farm where the food grows? Then we don't even have to move the food as far. We just got to move the people one time. Time, right that makes sense so that's what they do they build a new internment camp it is 40 miles out into the country it is in a place called los baños right off los baños the, Bay, the biggest lake in the philippines it is a naturally beautiful area there's a ton of naturally thriving tropical fruit like bananas and coconuts and there is also a bunch of agricultural villages that are going to be able to help get food for all the internees and that's basically how the japanese pitch this to the internees hey it's basically going to be a happy summer camp you guys are all going to go hang out in the <laughs> tropical paradise eat bananas and hang out till the war is over some people buy it and they volunteer to go to this new internment camp. A lot of people aren't really buying it. And amongst the people that aren't buying it are the medical professionals. None of the medical professionals, none of the doctors, none of the nurses want to go to this new internment camp. They want to stay put. And just as the first batch of internees were getting ready to ship out to the new internment camp at Los Banos and it looked like they were going to have no medical staff, finally a doctor by the name of Dr. Dana Nance and 11 naval nurses that would later come to be known as the Sacred Eleven would volunteer to go with them. When it was all said and done, 2,147 internees would end up living at the Los Banos internment camp. And in the beginning, similar to Santo Tomas, things are pretty okay, bearing everything in mind. And once again, the local Filipinos are being a huge help. They're literally bringing in carts and carts of food every day to help get these internees more and more calories. And then a change of command happens. They put this guy in charge by the name of Haiwanaka, and he's this washed up Japanese officer that is just completely hands off. He's not there at all. The dude doesn't even get in his uniform anymore. He literally just walks around camp all day with his sandals in his kimono doesn't give a shit about anything so his second in charge is basically running the show and his second in command is a man by the name of sadaki konishi and he is he's evil there's oh no shit, other way to not good. Uh, <laughs> that tone chip no oh no i shouldn't be laughing at this i really shouldn't it's just a tone shift yeah i was like oh that uh 
That don't look good. Coming to power, he cuts the internees rations to 800 calories a day, not because he needed to, not because he didn't have the supplies. He had all the food in the world. Yeah. He just simply wanted to do it to see people suffer. He no oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Locals to bring in. Yep. It's food. that this one guy. An internment camp with men and women commingling naturally over the course of months and years, they would form relationships. <clears throat> and every once in a while, a woman would get pregnant. And there were at times multiple women pregnant or multiple small children in the internment camp at Los Banos. Because of that, the Red Cross would send dehydrated milk to the camp to give to these small children. Konishi would have his men dump the dehydrated milk out on the ground in front of starving mothers to live the fuck? babies. Why are you the way that you are? Whenever the Japanese chain of command would deliver The fuck, dude? The fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> dude, I remember that one video when we started saying, oh, Japanese thought, uh, fucking, uh, fucking Marine soldiers are actually fucking Criminals from um, uh, from prison. It's like fuck. You got one guy. That's what it seems like a dude from prison. Some men just want to watch the world burn. Fruit or vegetables, any type of produce as part of the rations. He would leave it outside for days in the sun, letting it get infested with insects before finally letting the internees pick through it and eat whatever they could. This went on for months and years and he would continually cut rations more and more for whatever he deemed to be a transgression until the internees were eating only 400 calories a day. And as if starving thousands of people wasn't bad enough, Konishi would constantly taunt them the entire time, never letting them forget that the only reason they were in this condition was because he said so. On one occasion, he told the men that he had 100 pound bags of rice in a storage building across camp and that they could have it if the men would carry it over to the barracks and they could cook it and eat it. So the men that had been starving and lost a third of their body weight go across camp, carry hundred pound bags of rice. In this dude is a piece of shit. Into the rest of the camp for the women and the children and themselves to finally be able to eat only for. I'm going to have to cut out that uh, last word there. Konishi to tell them that he had changed his mind and that they needed to take the rice back or he would shoot them. And then they took the rice back and locked it away. Over time, all of the internees began starving to death and showing symptoms related to it, whether it be parasites from eating things they shouldn't be eating, a malnutrition disease known as beriberi, dysentery, or scurvy. Dr. Nance and the Sacred Eleven were doing everything they could to help everybody, but ultimately they too were starving to death. There's a lot of different accounts of how bad it got at Los Banos, but the one that stands out the most is when a Catholic priest told everybody that the only way to get out of this now was with the help of God and that they all needed to pray. And one of the nuns there said that if they were going to get out of this alive, God was going to have to send the angels to come get them. The angels. <laughs> yes, that's a nice transition. Let's go. <laughs> well, actually, the air quotes, angels. February 1943, one month before Los Banos would receive its first internees, the United States military activated a new unit, the 11th Airborne Division, a.k.a. The Angels. And just for the record, that's not <laughs> me trying to be cute, calling them the Angels because it makes my story go good. That's their actual nickname, and they got it for... <laughs> A completely different reason from anything to do with Los Banos. So, the training of the 11th Airborne Division... Yeah, that dude... Dude, if that's not divine intervention, I don't know what it is in some weird way. Extremely important, and that is because General Eisenhower is not impressed with how airborne units have performed in North Africa and Sicily so far, and he thinks that airborne divisions just don't need to exist anymore. No division-sized element of airborne should be a thing. He doesn't think it's effective. We don't need really? it. Another general that he respects and that he actually went to West Point with and is known for his entire career by the name of Major General Swing disagrees, and he volunteers to go back and train the 11th Airborne to show how effective an airborne division can be. So Major General Swing comes back to America to stand up the 11th Airborne to show how good airborne units can be. And his selection process to get into his new unit is absolutely brutal. The only men that make it through are star high school and collegiate level athletes. But Swing didn't just want a bunch of brawn, he also wanted brains. He made it a requirement that every single man in the 11th Airborne Division at its inception had to have a military IQ test score of 110 or higher. This meant that physically and intellectually, this entire division, from the leadership all the way down to the lowest ranking private, were all qualified to go to officer candidate school, both mentally and physically, which is absolutely crazy. Swing only wanted the best of the best, and he actually got in trouble. 
Yeah, I imagine you would need better standards like that. Kicking back so many recruits because they didn't meet his standards to be in the 11th Airborne Division. Because of that, they actually expected him to lower the standards and start letting more people in. But by then, he had actually found all the men that he needed. Because Airborne Divisions in World War II weren't as big as regular divisions. A normal division had about 15,000 men. An Airborne Division had about 8,000 men. They also didn't have heavy artillery. They had lighter artillery. They didn't have tanks. They had light vehicles. All the stuff they had, they could jump with. So, they were lighter, but they they were also faster, meaner, and smarter. Nice. So Major General Swing has basically went through like 30,000 guys and distilled out the best 8,000 dudes, just the raw talent, the best of the best, the strongest, the fastest, and the smartest. And he trains the dog shit out of these guys. Yeah. Absolute. <laughs> monsters he's, <laughs> Fuck yeah. he's striving to make this batch of like 19 to 23 year old kids the best i'll be back for a sec Uh, we're back best of the best and he tells them as much he tells these kids they're going to be able to eat nails and spit out razor blades by the time they're done with uh, the training and uh, you know what they believe him major general swing oh my god that reminds me it's doing remind me of that spongebob clip or uh welcome to the salty spittoon how tough are you welcome to the salty spittoon how tough are you was born in the 1800s dude fought in world war one he's already been in theater in world war ii and he's telling them you guys are the best of the best and if anybody would know it's gonna be him so they believe him and this is where they start to get their nickname the angels you see they're overly athletic they're above average smart and they're getting their ego pumped up and they're a bunch of 20 year old kids naturally <laughs> when they go out on leave they're gonna be rowdy if these guys aren't training to kick ass they're partying these guys are going out getting hammered getting in fights getting thrown in jail every chance they, oh, they start fucking with the chain of command thinking it's funny at one point they actually prank major general swing you got to realize general swing is born in the 1800s the dude fought in world war one he's he's the old guy okay he's old old school military officer at this point and those old school military officers all played polo that was like the boys club thing that was like oh, really? what golf is now right and they went out and they stole major general swings polo horse <laughs> as a joke and then there was also that time that they got in trouble for spear hunting for pigs using their bayonets mounted on their m1 grand so that they could have a barbecue the 11th airborne guys got in so much trouble so often that it became a running joke kind of sort of not really a joke an actual point of conversation in the morning officers meeting on monday first order of business how many of our little angels woke up in jail this morning <laughs> And that's where they got the nickname, the Angels. And to be fair to the 11th Airborne, they weren't unique in being this rowdy. This is pretty much standard behavior yeah. for all Airborne units in World War II, whether people are willing to admit it or not. I mean, for example, later in the war, the 82nd Airborne was on leave over in France, and they got so rowdy that the U.S. military had to send out a special military police unit just to get them under control. So yeah, paratroopers are always kind of wild, but back in World War II, they were exceptionally wild. But as it turns out, when your job is to lead the way into armed conflict, riding a fucking kite, that's exactly the type of guy you want doing the job a dude that gets a little bit rowdy speaking of kite that does actually kind of make the 11th airborne a little bit unique because you could argue that they are the most airborne unit of world war ii and that is because major general swing made every single man in the 11th airborne division double certified in both parachute and glider infantry okay wow. you know what parachute infantry is nice. we've all seen saving private ryan we've all seen band of brothers it's the guys that jump out of a plane with mm -hmm. a parachute right that's easy what a lot of people have never seen before is a military glider and i have no idea why if i had to guess i would assume it's, because it's hard to replicate for hollywood. i don't know either show me hollywood inside of a movie but they were real and they're absolutely badass it's basically a giant kite that looks like a plane that a c-47 literally tows behind it into the battlefield so the c-47's got a bunch of paratroopers jumping out of the side of it and it's also towing a giant plane-sized kite that's capable of carrying like 3700 pounds and a bunch of guys inside wow it. and then as the 
the paratroopers jump out, the gliders detach at this rope, and then they glide the rest of the way into the country and land this plane. Okay, side note, unpopular opinion. This is the most gangster vehicle of World War II, okay? You know who I don't want to have to get in a fight with? The guy that shows up for military training to partake in the biggest war the world has ever seen. And when everybody else is like, oh, I want to drive a Sherman tank. I want to serve on a battleship. I want to drive an Amtrak. And this motherfucker's showing up like, ah, fuck it. I want to drive a kite into battle 12 hours. <laughs> before everybody else and be surrounded by the enemy. Fuck that. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. The point I'm trying to get to is A, gliders No, you're built different. You are built different. Exist and they're cool in case you didn't know that. And B, Major General Swing makes the entire 11th Airborne Division cross train on both. So every single man in his division can both jump out of a plane with a parachute or be towed behind a plane in a giant kite with 3,000 pounds of shit in it, which no other Airborne Division was doing at the time. You were either a parachute guy or you were a kite guy. So the 11th Airborne Division gets done with their training by December of 1943. And now it's time to show Eisenhower what's up. So they set up this big war game mock mission whatever you want to call it known as the Knollwood maneuver where the go fellas go the 11th airborne division is supposed to capture an airfield now remember a lot of the leadership is trying to get rid of airborne divisions they want to prove how ineffective that this is so this is not going to be an easy mission okay in order to succeed they have to capture 13 objectives all at the same time secure an area to land the rest of the division capture the entire airfield hold it for a certain amount of time and then also be able to evacuate casualties as they go like this mission has to go perfect. And that's exactly what happens. The 11th Airborne <laughs> Division on the first wave drops in 4,800 okay. guys using 200 C-47s and over 200 gliders. They absolutely crush this mission. At this wow. point, Major General Swing and the rest of the high-ranking military officers that are kind of rooting for the Airborne Divisions look over at Eisenhower like a bunch of kids looking at Dad, asking if they can keep the stray dog they just found. Like, Dad, can we keep them? Look at how fucking awesome these guys are, please. And finally, Eisenhower's just like, fine, whatever, we can keep it. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that the 11th Airborne has just saved the entire concept of Airborne as a whole, okay? When the average person thinks about paratroopers, they're thinking about jumping into Normandy, D-Day, Market Garden, all that stuff in the European theater. All that stuff is downstream from this, okay? All of the Airborne divisions would have been disbanded, and that never would have happened were it not for the 11th Airborne proving to Eisenhower how effective Airborne can be. So right out of the gate, the 11th Airborne Airborne has already changed the world, and in a small way, they are responsible for the success of every other airborne mission mm -hmm. that came after this. So naturally, as a reward, they get sent into the European theater where they're going to get to do things like jump in on D-Day, jump in and participate in the biggest airborne operation of all time, Operation Mark yeah. Martin. They're going to be remembered I'm and celebrated, a butt. and there's going to be movies. I'm sensing a butt. And TV shows about them, and everybody's gonna know who they are. I'm just kidding. Uh, they get the distinct honor of getting sent in as the only airborne division to go into the Pacific Theater, and most people have absolutely no idea who they are, and they're never talked about ever. But we're fixing that shit today. So they make their way over to the Pacific Theater, and the first place they wind up is in New Guinea. And unfortunately, at this point in time, there's a little bit of a lull in the combat because the U.S. military is gearing up for the invasion of Leyte. And until then, the 11th Airborne is just kind of in New Guinea, and they're tasked with basically unloading cargo ships at this big dock to help with the war effort because there's really no asses to be kicked. Wow. Right now. now, the 11th Airborne guys are not very happy about this. You got to remember, a bunch of 20-year-old young men been training their ass off for the past year to get ready to go into a fight had their ego pumped up by their chain of command and now about that. they finally make it into war and their job is to unload a bunch of cargo ships they're pretty disappointed so to make themselves feel better they steal shit i mean strategically transfer equipment to an alternate location and by alternate location i mean to their campsite and when i say equipment i mean pretty much anything and everything that's cool they take it as theirs. Literally entire crates of Colt 45 1911s, booze, cigarettes, good food. They're stealing entire Jeeps and vehicles wow. and using them at their camp. And nobody's really saying anything to them and they're getting away with it. So they get a little bit bolder and eventually they're like, fuck it. We're just going to steal the generator for the dock and we're going to take it back to our camp and wire up our camp so we have electricity. So that's what they do. They steal the generator, bring it over to camp. General Swing catches them and he's like, no, no, no. You guys can't be stealing that generator. Or at least you can't wire up your tents. You're going to use it to wire up my tent. And they have to go wire up General Swing's <laughs> HQ. <laughs> Now, at this point, the guy that's actually in charge of the dock goes over to General Swing's quarters to where the 11th Airborne are. And he's like, your guys are stealing fucking everything. They need to stop. I need my generator back. At which point, Swing gets in a huge argument and says the famous line, my angels would never do that. Yes, <laughs> Uh, 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 
Oh my god. Oh. <laughs> my angels would never. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Oh god, I'm done. I'm done. Putting <laughs> in their nickname, the Angels. Shortly after that, the 11th Airborne would get orders that they were going to partake in the invasion of Leyte, and they would have to leave a bunch of their stolen goods behind. An MP unit came in to clean up their camp and reported back that there was an entire parking lot of stolen vehicles there. How'd that get in there? <laughs> So, Battle of Leyte, we talked about this last week with the 77th Infantry, aka the Old Bastards. They were there as well, but if you don't oh. remember or if you didn't watch that video, basically the Japanese government has come out and said that they are going to make the Battle of Leyte a decisive battle in the war. They are throwing in like, yeah, I think, I think I remember that. at this fight. I believe I remember that. Island. That was too Basically, long. the American forces have one half of the island, the Japanese forces have yeah, the and other then half, they, and they're they, both being And then they proceeded to fucking come over there and absolutely take it. It's like... Nah, nah, well, I'm, I'm taking it away from you. I'm taking your toys. I want that thing. And the allies would say, you can't have that thing. No. They supplied on their back ends and fighting in the middle, trying to claim this island. Eventually, the 77th Infantry Division would be sent around the backside of the island to make an amphibious landing and take over Ormok Bay, which is where the Japanese were getting their resupply from, cutting yep. off the enemy supply lines, while the rest of the Army and Marine units held the line, including the 11th Airborne, and continued to fight. The 11th Airborne Division and every other unit that fought at Leyte sustained heavy casualties, but for every single angel that fell on that battlefield, he took with him 45 enemy soldiers. After claiming victory at Leyte, the next objective to take is Lozon, the main island in the Philippines with the capital of Manila and the Los Banos internment camp. With this being the main island, there's no doubt that the Japanese are looking to make this a decisive battle as well. Luckily, three months prior to this, MacArthur had already sent someone to begin prepping the stage for an American victory at Lozon. Vanderpool and the gorillas. Oh God. No, it's guerrilla warfare. <laughs> Now, rewind like five months prior to the Battle of Leyte, and MacArthur is still headquartered back in Australia, and he finds out that there are a bunch of guerrilla groups all over the Philippines, especially on the main island of Lozon. Now, these guerrilla fighting units kind of operated like gangs. Each one had their own little chunk of territory, and they all weren't very friendly with one another because they were all kind of competing uh -oh. with one another to get aid from the U.S. military to be able to fight the Japanese better. So, they were very disorganized, but some units were much more organized than others. So, huh. General MacArthur figured that if he can send somebody in there to help organize the I was like, yeah, someone's going to have to go in there and dad dick the situation. Gorillas, ...and then get them more supplies and more weapons, they'll be softening up the Japanese from the inside, so by the time the U.S. forces reach Lozon, it won't be as hard of a fight as it needs to be. So, he starts taking volunteers, starts poking around, finally, he figures out the guy that he wants to send in, and it's this badass major by the name of Jay Vanderpool. So, he takes Vanderpool, sends him off to do a bunch of training in, like, how to set up long-range communication, how to set up communication networks, works basically the quick and dirty on how to be a fucking spy okay. so that training <laughs> takes about two months we are now three months away from the battle of Leyte, and jay and a couple of other guys are now going to get snuck into lozon by submarine and dropped off on the island they have one person they can link up with for a connection but basically their standing orders are and i quote do what will best further the allied cause signed <laughs> general macarthur my time has come Literally the top dog of the U.S. military. The only person with more authority than General MacArthur at this point is the President of the United States, okay? This dude's orders are basically the golden ticket, the blank check, mm -hmm. do whatever you want, just be a menace to the enemy. So, first order of business, he finds out who the best gorillas on Luzon are, and it's this group called Hunters ROTC. It's ran by a bunch of ex- For a second there, I thought he was about to say Hunters are us, and I'm like, no. Are they actually called Hunters R.S.? Filipino army guys that are actually coordinating their men like an actual military. They have a chain of command. They have order. They actually do military tactics. They are conducting legitimate guerrilla warfare and they are fucking good. They've got 2,500 men and they are a gigantic pain in the Japanese ass. So Jay needs to get linked up with them, get them more organized and get them more supplies, more guns, more ammo, more food, more water, more everything. <laughs> He needs 
to hook these guys up so they can be an even bigger pain in the ass. The problem is, is they're like 60 miles away on the other side of the island, and Jay is like a 5 foot 10 white guy, all the other white people have been thrown in internment camps, and on top of that, he's wearing a US military uniform. The odds of him making it 60 miles through enemy territory on this island, not looking too great. So what's Jay gonna do? I mean, the meatheads are probably like, I mean, he could just walk there through the jungle, avoid the roads, don't go into town, he'll get there in two weeks, it'll be fine, he'll get the job done. Other people are like, he could probably, you know, pay somebody to drive him there in a trunk, smuggle him in, that would be an option. Jay Vanderpool is just like, nah, I'm gonna go, just complete gangster option. I'm gonna walk to the nearest town, go to a payphone, I'm gonna call up a fucking limo to drive him <laughs> there. So that's what he does. He calls a valet service and some fancy black SUV comes pulling up and they're like, cool, give me a ride okay. 60 miles away to wherever the Hunter ROTC people are. Okay. The limo driver, SUV driver, whatever you want to call him, taxi driver is like, I don't want to give you Americans a ride. If the Japanese catch me, they're going to kill me. At which point Vanderpool and his guys are like, look, this SUV is taking me to where I need to go. You can take this stack of cash and give me your car or you can take this stack of cash. You can drive me there, drop me off, and then you can keep your car. Either way, this SUV is taking me to where I'm going. Are you driving or not? So the driver's <laughs> like, fine, I'll do it. They drive all the way there. They pass through multiple Japanese checkpoints oh because God. it's such a fancy vehicle. The Japanese don't even bother to stop them. They just salute and wave. <laughs> through assuming that it's somebody important it is fucking like, so stupid it, it's so stupid but it worked dude there's no way that should have worked but it worked that is so dumb that it's genius all at the same time it's exactly it worked it's the funniest fucking part that, that's story. awesome <laughs> This happens multiple times and they make it all the way to the village where Hunter's ROTC is located. And when they get out, the leadership of Hunter's ROTC just sees Americans in American military uniforms getting out of like this dope black SUV 60 miles <laughs> inland. In hey, yo, this man was doing big brain plays. Uh, this man was fucking like playing 5D chess. Enemy territory. So the guerrilla leaders are thinking like, oh shit, these guys are gangster as fuck. Fuck. <laughs> look back. Dude, that's fucking awesome. That's really badass, guys. That, that's dangerous. So already they're off to a great foot due to Vanderpool's insane strategy of calling a limo to drive him through enemy territory. And then Vanderpool whips out his printed out order from General MacArthur, basically saying do whatever to further the allied cause, at which point the guerrillas are just completely game to do whatever. They're more than happy to help in any way they can because they know who General MacArthur is, and this is their best shot at making a measurable impact to save their country. So Jay Vanderpool has been in Luzon for all of like six hours and he is now essentially in charge of 2,500 men that are experts in jungle warfare. Now, these guys have been an issue the entire time, but they're so under equipped that they weren't able to do as much as they could. Like they're not living up to their full potential because these guys are going in and launching raids against the Japanese and every guy has like three bullets in his gun because they just don't have ammo. Then they're whipping out their bolo knives and using those to fight the Japanese. Now with Jay, he's gonna be calling in and getting them new guns and a ton of ammunition so they can actually function like a guerrilla fighting force. and they are gonna get escalated from an issue to a fucking problem for the Japanese. Then over the course of the next three months, while the 11th Airborne is in New Guinea and fighting in Leyte, Vanderpool is in Luzon getting his guerrilla network even bigger. He's getting more guerrilla units to cooperate with him and he's getting them guns and ammo as well. And he builds this entire command. I imagine this is gonna tie it back into the uh, 11th and in some way structure that he calls the ggc the general guerrilla command and then he teaches <laughs> all of them how to gather intel spy on the japanese and send long-range communications so now not only is his guerrilla fighting force a guerrilla fighting force but they're doubling as a spy network as well in wow. the span of three months jay vanderpool has essentially turned himself into the guerrilla warlord of the philippines <laughs> so fast forward january 9th 1945 american forces were victorious at leyte and now they are making their invasion into lozon with like 175,000 men 
It is a massive offensive operation. Yeah. And Jay Vanderpool, our favorite guerrilla warlord, has positioned all of his guerrilla fighters in between the American landings and the Japanese main forces. So that way, when the Japanese try to make their way to the beaches where the Americans are landing, they're going to be attacking them on the roads with ambushes the entire time, yeah. softening the enemy before they even <laughs> get there to play defense. And here's what I need you to understand about this. This is 1945. The Japanese are not winning this war. It's not going good for them at all. Their supply lines are breaking down. They're having trouble getting their men ammunition, food. Everything is going about as bad as it can be for the Japanese at this point in time. Emotional damage. Okay, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that the Japanese are now the ones that probably aren't going to have a whole lot of ammo. And now the gorillas are being backed by America, the biggest unhealth care network the world has ever seen. They've got all the ammo on the planet. Well, well, yeah. well. How the turntables. I think it me how the tables have turned. How the turns have tabled. Now, Jay Vanderpool, being the smart guy that he is, he knows this and he takes advantage of it. He has the gorillas just start mag dumping everybody. He tells them, you guys have more ammo than them, abuse it. He even goes as far as to have the gorillas start using an old school infantry tactic called marching fire, which is basically get a bunch of your guys, have them stand in a line and start walking towards the enemy with their rifles on their hip. And every time their right foot hits the ground, they fire. Now, this is like a World War One tactic. The theory wow. being that you're both advancing and laying your own suppressing fire at the same time, obviously, as you were marching towards an entrenched I can enemy. imagine it's like boom, 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 boom with machine guns so the tactic never really worked that great but in world war ii in this application when the enemy's just out on an open road and they don't have enough ammunition to lay suppressing fire back it worked out great in addition to that there was also a huge psychological factor because you got to remember jay oh, yeah. is like coordinating the gorillas i can't refer to yeah they're gonna attack on both ends both Physical warfare and psychological warfare. But he's not actually in charge. The real guerrilla leaders could tell Jay Vanderpool to get fucked at any point in time and he would have no other choice but to do so. And the reason I'm bringing this up is I'm trying to get the message across to you that these Filipino guerrilla fighters don't really give a shit about the Geneva Convention. They've never even heard of her. Believe me, you would much rather come toe to toe with the American military at this point in time because these Filipino guerrillas were not taken prisoners and they were not messing around. They are experts in jungle warfare and they do not like the Japanese. The Japanese have been extremely cruel to the Filipino people for the last three we years of the occupation and yeah. they're out to get straight Them up blood. revenge Chew up. We give no water. like if you got shot and injured going up against the philippines like they're out for blood no gorillas you weren't injured for very long because as soon as you hit the ground the bolo knives are coming out and these guys are looking at you like my wife looks at amazon packages okay <laughs> and every single time i bring something like this up i get this in the comment section Oh, he's back now. That's a war crime. Buh. To which I mean, yeah, sure, I guess. But I mean, what do you what do you think is going to happen? Because you say it with this conviction, like you think RoboCop is going to descend from the heavens and enforce <laughs> justice. Because I hate to break it to you in your fragile worldview, but guess how many Filipino guerrillas got convicted of war crimes after World War II? Zero. Absolutely fucking zero. I knew it. Okay, now look, I'm not saying that's right. I'm just saying that it happened. And to be honest with you, I'm not that upset about it. I mean, we've all seen this situations, right? It's not appropriate to punch some in the face but also if you're at the bar with your wife and some dude walks up smash yeah. your wife on the ass and so like yeah that face is going down and like so your face is about to be you know your face is about to get caved in says hey sweetheart how would you like to go home with a real man and you turn around and punch that motherfucker in the face fucking nah. He kind of deserved it. And if you don't like that, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. But guess what? The good news in all of this is it's easily avoidable. All you have to do is not invade the Philippines and then go out of your way to be evil and cruel to all the locals for no fucking reason. And this probably won't happen to you, okay? Simplest concept in the world. I know a lot of people struggle with it. I'm going to say it real slow. Don't fuck around and you won't find out, okay? Mm -hmm. I hope that this lesson is helpful. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Fuck around. No, fuck around. Find out. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Moral of the story, the Filipino guerrillas are out in the jungle being complete gangsters going up against the Japanese. Now, after a while, it gets to the point where Vanderpool's contact is like, yo, you need to chill. You're expending so much ammo that the general whose AO that you're inside of is going to get mad that you're taking up some of his ammo and you just need to slow it down because you're burning up too much. To which his guy's like, I don't know, it's some hard ass by the name of General Swing who's in charge of the 11th Airborne Division. To which Vanderpool is like, cool, you send General Swing down here. He can see my results speak for themselves and we'll see what he has to say so it's a date the next morning yeah i imagine it was like this is gonna link up with them in some way 
General Swing is going to have his driver bring him out to where Vanderpool is, and they're going to have a little conversation about how much ammunition he's burning up. But before that happens, that night, the gorillas set up guarding a particular road, and as it would happen, right at dusk, an entire Japanese battalion comes marching down this road, advancing towards the American lines. The gorillas launch an ambush and wipe out the entire battalion, a thousand men. So the next morning, General Swing comes rolling down the very same road with his driver and his aide in uh -oh. his car and an okay. armed escort, and he gets about halfway there, and he starts noticing there's an awful lot of opened Amazon packages, I mean dead guys, <laughs> on the side of the road. And the closer he gets to where Vanderpool's supposed to be, the more and more of them there are. And after a little bit, General Swing just tells his driver, all right, turn this shit around. He leans over to his aide and says, and I quote, you give Vanderpool all the goddamn ammunition he wants. So this continues for about a month as the American forces fight their way through Lausanne to Manila. So Battle of Manila kicks off February 3rd, 1945, and the first order of business is to liberate Santo Tomas internment camp, and that also happens on February 3rd. And what they find at Santo Tomas is absolutely horrific. The conditions of the camp have done nothing but gone down since 1943, and the conditions that they are living in in 1945 are very similar to what I've already highlighted when I talked about Los Banos previously. Because of this, General MacArthur himself decides that he needs to see this with his own eyes so he goes and visits Santo Tomas and immediately decides that his next order of business is to liberate the Los Banos internment camp immediately and he gives that order directly to General Swing in the 11th Airborne Division. Okay I need you to understand that's a really okay. big deal. General MacArthur is like top dog in the military. It's President MacArthur everybody else. MacArthur doesn't tell individual divisions or units what to do. He doesn't give those kinds of orders. He tells entire military branches what to do and those orders get disseminated down through the ranks amongst the different generals and it goes through like a whole chain of command thing. He has just skipped several rungs of the command structure to give this order directly to General Swing, which speaks volumes as to what MacArthur thinks of the 11th Airborne because he thinks that they are the exact people for the job and he doesn't want the chain of command to fuck that up. So while the 11th Airborne Division is actively fighting in Manila, they are also beginning to make preparations to somehow rescue an internment camp that is 40 miles away. The plan. So right out of the gate, Vanderpool sends a bunch of gorillas over to Los Banos. They're going to be living in the jungle 24-7, keeping an eye and keeping tabs on the internment camp and reporting back any intel they have. In addition to that, the gorillas also have standing orders to make an emergency attack and try to save as many internees as possible if they need to. The reason for that is because there's a pretty big and pretty legitimate concern that if the Japanese are going to abandon that internment camp, that they would try to execute all the prisoners first. And in the unfortunate event of that happening, the gorillas have the order to attack and try to save as many people as possible. Now, with the planning of this mission, bear in mind that the 11th Airborne is still fighting actively in the Battle of Manila, and while that's going on, they're also trying to plan this mission, and this mission is seemingly impossible. Oh my god! Oh, now, the planning of this mission is done by a young officer in the 11th Airborne known as Henry Mueller, and his plan is absolutely genius. Okay, so here's the initial problem. Los Banos is 40 miles behind enemy lines, and there is an entire infantry division between the Americans and this internment camp approximately 10,000 Japanese soldiers known as the Tiger Division. So if the Americans launch a major offensive and try to punch through and destroy that division, they're going to radio back to Los Banos and they're worried that that means that they're going to execute all the prisoners. So that's not really an option, meaning the only thing they can do is do an airborne operation where they jump in right on top of the internment camp. So Mueller starts getting intel back from the guerrillas and they have this hand-drawn map of the camp and the surrounding area. And there is this big ass field about a thousand yards away from the Los Banos internment camp. And it is big enough for them to be able to land an entire company of paratroopers there. But you still have the issue of the C-47s have to fly overhead, the company has to jump out of the planes, float down, land, get their shit together, and run as fast as they can a thousand yards, get into the internment camp, and stop the guards. So they figure that at best that's going to be about 15 minutes from the moment the paratroopers jump out of the plane to the moment that they're able to land, ditch their parachutes, grab their guns, and full assholes and elbows sprint all the way to the internment camp. That is still too long. That is 15 minutes where the Japanese have the opportunity to shoot as many people as possible. Easy solution. They're going to send in the 11th Airborne Division's recon platoon 
platoon, which is like 11th Airborne Division is already above average. The recon platoon is their best guys on top of it. They're going to send in their recon platoon. They're going to link up with 800 guerrilla fighters, and they are going to be sitting right outside of Los Banos. And the second the C-47s fly overhead, they're going to launch an attack, and they're going to fight the guards in the internment camp, meaning that the guards are going to have to take up all their time fighting them as opposed to executing prisoners and give the airborne guys a like time a solid to, get plan. to reinforce them and they can overrun the camp. So this mission is already crazy. There's a lot of moving parts, but Mueller just has to assume that everything goes according to plan because from there it gets even harder. So when we assume that this is all went according to plan, this means that the guards have all been taken care of and there's now approximately like 1100 ish soldiers there between the guerrillas and the American forces. And there's approximately 2,100 internees that are in their final stages of starving to death. And they now have to transport that 2,100 people 40 miles away and they don't have any vehicles. So that in itself is a huge logistical issue, but then you have to also add on to the fact that there is 10,000 Japanese Tiger Division soldiers blocking the route to get back to where you need to go. So at this point, Henry Mueller is like, you know what? We're just going to do some gangster shit. We're going to drive our tanks through the biggest lake in the Philippines uh -oh. to get there. So in addition to the guerrillas in the recon platoon waiting in the bushes for their moment to attack, the paratroopers falling from the sky, there is also going to be an entire battalion of amphibious tractors, Amtraks, floating tanks that are going to drive across Laguna de Bay, the biggest lake in the Philippines. and then drive two miles further inland to hit up Los Banos, and then they are gonna be the ones that smash through the gate, and they are gonna pick up all the internees and drive them back across the lake into friendly territory. It's genius. The only problem at this point is that they don't okay. have enough Amtraks to be able to load yeah, up Yeah, I, I imagine there's something the gonna be. Camp. So when the Amtraks do show up in Los Banos, they're gonna load up all the kids, all the women, and the men that are the sickest and unable to walk the two miles to Laguna de Bay. Then the Amtraks are gonna take off, drive slash sail, all the way back across the biggest lake of the Philippines, drop people off, turn around, head back across it again to go pick up everybody else. And that's the problem because while they're waiting with their backs to a giant body of water, that infantry division, the tiger division of 10,000 angry Japanese soldiers are going to have time to make it back to the internment camp, track them down, and presumably slaughter everybody because they're not going to stand a chance. It would be 10 to 1 and these guys are going to be showing up with tanks, mortars, and artillery. So in order to address that, they're going to build up a massive American force right on the front line directly in front of this Japanese Tiger Division, effectively forcing them to have a Mexican standoff with the American division. And this is going to put the Japanese leadership in the position of like, I know that there's a prison raid going on directly behind me, but if I turn around to address it, this entire American army is going to kick my ass. So they're effectively just going to have to sit there in this staring contest and let this raid go on <laughs> between them, even though they know it's happening. It's genius. Mueller is effectively playing 4D chess. So Harry Miller <laughs> yeah. takes his plan yeah. to General Swing, lays it all out, and General Swing is like, okay, let's let's do it. It should work. The problem is we can't do it yet because we don't have enough manpower. We're still fighting the Battle of Manila, and we've taken so many casualties between Leyte, fighting down through Lozon, and now the Battle of Manila. We just don't have the guys to spare right now, but we're going to do it as soon as we can. So they're forced to kick the can down the road for like two weeks, and during this two weeks, somebody from Los Banos escapes the prison camp and makes their way over to the 11th Airborne's area of operation, and they get picked up, and Mueller hears about it. So Mueller wants to talk to this guy. He wants to know everything about the camp. Maybe he's missing something. Maybe there's something he could do to make his plan better, make it more effective, save more people. So Mueller brings this guy into his office and they start talking. And this guy is, he's, he's brilliant. He's memorized everything. He was previously an engineer and this dude went as far as pacing off different buildings. He actually had measurements of how far it is from the gate to this building, from this building to that building. Amazing, mission complete. That right there is why you're the best boss. He knew where every machine gun emplacement was. He was able to draw out a very accurate map, every guard tower, Fucking every... So that alone awesome. was a huge help. But in addition to that, Mueller wanted to know the schedule. He wanted to know- I, I believe that type of person was called an eidetic ident memory. I mean, not the person, but the like, things called eidetic memory or like, uh, essentially photographic memory daily life of everybody living in Los Banos. So he has him walking through an entire day. Like when you wake up, tell me everything that happens. What's the patterns? What are the guards up to? 
What's the deal? At this point, the gentleman informs Mueller that every single day it begins with most of the guards, like 99% of them, all but like 20 dudes that they leave at the guard towers, proceed to go lock all their guns in their barracks, and then they go out in the field next to the internment camp in their underwear and sandals and do calisthenics. They're out there doing stretches and push-ups and shit to stay in good fighting shape. To which Henry Mueller's like, fucking excuse me? You mean to tell me that if I time this mission right, I literally get to catch these guys outside of the internment camp in sandals and their underwear while they're tired and sweaty. I gotta go. He goes straight to General Swing's office and he's like, hey, we gotta move up the timeline for this mission. The original schedule was that the paratroopers were gonna be jumping out of the C-47s at eight o'clock in the morning. And Henry is like, we gotta, we gotta bump that back. They gotta jump out at seven in the morning, right in the middle of these guys doing push-ups in their underwear. We're literally gonna catch the enemy <laughs> with their pants down. Yeah, with now, the, the pants down. All the way to General Swing to get this approved was because before that, the earliest they could be there was eight o'clock in the morning. The reason for that was because they wanted the C-47s to have the light of dawn to be able to take off just because it's easier getting that many planes in the air when everybody can see and it's not dark out but everybody pretty much agreed this is worth it we're gonna do it anyways so yeah. that's the plan the plan is set in stone we just have to wait until we have the manpower to actually pull it off and then several things happen the first one being that a local farmer and fisherman is sailing his boat around laguna de bay and he ends up seeing the los banos prison camp or prisoners from it somehow and he reports back to the americans how sickly and how poorly they are being treated so that's number one the secondary thing that happens is vanderpool's gorillas report back that the japanese are digging a massive hole in the ground a humongous trench and at the top of it are machine gun emplacements and everybody assumes the worst that they are digging a, a mass grave why are you the way that you are so that's it time to shit or get off the pot we're doing this and we're doing it right now get that right. big military force yeah, built out right in front of the tiger division so they can start their mexican standoff <laughs> Recon platoon out in the jungle with the gorillas and spool up the C 47s. And for the love of God, somebody turn on Fortunate Son while we do it. I don't care if it doesn't come out till 1969 and it's February 23rd, 1945. Just make it happen. Oh, thank God. The raid. Oh, Early morning, February 23rd, the raid. All of the 11th Airborne Division guys start loading on to the C 47s. Now, originally, they had just slotted one company to go in and make this jump, but a lot more than just one company worth of guys ends up showing up. Oh, please, now, please, I no. This with no copyright, please. Document. They weren't on the manifest, but it was very much one of those situations where everybody in the 11th Airborne Division wanted to be on this mission, okay? They'd already been through hell together. They fought through Leyte. They fought through Lozon. They're in the Battle of Manila, and they had free. Santo Tomas and all of them had seen the horrors that were happening inside of that POW camp and absolutely everybody wanted to help. So more guys showed up whether they were supposed to or not and they jumped as well. So they load up into the C-47s, they take off. Problem, one of the C-47s landing gear won't retract back up into the plane. Apparently, in the darkness of night, one of the maintainers on the ground forgot to pull the locking pin out of the landing gear, and now they can't pull the landing gear up, meaning they can't get up to speed. They are going to miss the hit time. Oh my god, bro. Oh, man. Oh, man. What the fuck, man? I'm Okay, right out of the gate, that's a big fucking problem. I mean, it's only one of the planes, so it's got approximately like 28 paratroopers in it, but in a mission this small, 28 guys can be a make or break amount of dudes. And we don't have time to turn around, pull the pin out, and get that plane back up into the air. We can't have all of the C-47s slow down because then none of them will make their hit time. And they all have to be there when they're supposed to be there because those Amtraks are showing up on time. The recon platoon and the gorillas are showing up on time. And most importantly, we gotta catch the enemy literally with their pants down in a field doing push at this point, the pilots are like, fuck it. I'm just going to floor it the entire way there with the landing gear down. I'll just beat the atmosphere into submission for the next 40 miles to which the radio tower is like, you're going to blow an engine if you do that. And the pilots respond with, well, let's hope I blow it on the way back. And I think we can all agree that's gangster as fuck. Yeah, well, that's that is. The recon platoon and the scouts are going and they're getting into position. And one of the recon guys, a guy by the name of Terry Santos, as he's coming up to the camp, approaches this guard hut that's like kind of right out in the middle of nowhere. It's like an early warning system. And inside of it's just one man sleeping on his gun and he's got a field phone in his other hand. And Terry pulls out his knife. He's going to kill this guy. But then he stops. He realizes that this guy's out there as an early warning system. He's probably got to check in every hour, every half hour, every 15 minutes. He has no idea. 
And if this guy misses a check-in, it's gonna put the entire camp on alert. So he resheathes his knife and just sneaks past him. I don't need it. I don't need it. I definitely don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. I don't need it. Okay, side note, luckiest Japanese soldier in the entire story, and he's yeah. been a complete shitbag. So, all I'm saying, sometimes being a shitbag could save your life. I mean, what's the shitbag's creed? Never stand when you could sit, never sit when you could lay down, and never be awake when you could be asleep? Yeah, <laughs> this just saved this guy's life. Anyways, the scouts and the gorillas, they all go out, they get in position. Thanks to the new drawn map from the previous escapee, they know where every single guard tower and guard hut is. And there are scouts literally sitting outside of them on the other side of the wall, next to the windows with grenades, waiting to hear the C-47s coming up. And they're just gonna toss grenades into all the guard checkpoints and take out all the guards at once immediately. I love it when a plan comes together. So they're in position and they're waiting and they're waiting and it feels like forever, but it's probably only like five or 10 minutes and they're waiting and they start to hear the faint drone of the c-47s off in the distance and they keep waiting until it gets louder and louder and then as soon as the japanese guys out working in the field turn to start looking up towards the sky they attack every guard hut on the ground gets a grenade through the window every guard tower gets raked with machine gun fire <laughs> Kenny santos runs in and the barracks that has all the guns inside of it and he throws white phosphorus grenades inside lighting the entire building on fire so that they can't even retrieve their guns if they wanted to another scout runs up to the commandant's office where the man in charge is supposed to be and the only japanese man in there runs and jumps out the window of the second story building and allegedly the scout shoots him out of midair with his colt 45. Missed Mr. Bomb. <laughs> Some of the guards are trying to fight, the paratroopers show up, and all in all, this entire affair is quick, violent, and over, with somewhere between 70 and 80 of the Japanese guards being killed in action, and the remainder of them fled off into the wood line in their underwear and sandals. So it's going perfect. Everything is gone 100% according to plan. Next thing you know, the Amtraks drive right through the front gate. They roll up. Their guys get out. They start trying to help load people into the Amtraks so they can all get out of there. And here's where things go off the rails. You see, what they didn't anticipate in this plan was a lack of cooperation from all the internees. And to be fair, they're not trying to be difficult. They don't want to not cooperate, but they don't realize the gravity of the situation. In their mind, you gotta remember, they're starving, they're hungry, they've lived mm -hmm. here for the past three years, this is their home. They think that the Americans have come to save them and they are now behind friendly lines. They don't realize that they're 40 miles deep behind enemy lines and that there's an army of 10,000 Japanese soldiers coming to potentially kill them at any moment. And the army guys don't exactly have time to explain that to 2,100 people, so they're kind of sitting over there like, guys, I need you to get on the Amtraks right now, and they're like running- Damn! back to the barracks like oh let me go pack my bags real quick no we don't have time for any of that shit it's chaos it's a complete shit show there's 2100 starving people running around trying to pack their bags there's people coming out of the barracks with furniture and mattresses and shit the paratroopers are 100 percent just channeling that dad energy of like trying to get mom and the kids out of the movie theater into the car sit down buckle up shut up so i can get us out of this parking lot to beat all the traffic out of here they're channeling that energy and finally <laughs> they're like no no we're not bringing any of this shit the clothes on your back and you get on the amtrak we have to leave right now and they're like fuck it they take white phosphorus grenades and they go and they light all the buildings on fire so that people have to get out of them because they need all of these people to fucking leave now. And amidst all the chaos, there's this famous interaction where this young woman in her 20s that's been in this internment camp the entire time comes up to one of the biggest, best looking paratroopers there and is like, are, are you a Marine? And he's like, no, I'm a paratrooper. Like trying to be Mr. Big Badass, right? And she's like, oh. All the time I've spent here in this internment camp, I've always dreamed about being rescued by a Marine. Which is just the ultimate cherry on top of this shit Sunday. Like, hey, sorry things aren't going that great at this moment. Also, don't know if it helps. Just wanted you to know that I would rather bang a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> in addition to that, there was a bunch of Catholic priests and nuns that had dropped to their knees praying, thanking God for literally sending angels to come and save them. At which point, the angels are like, 
Bro, do do that on the Amtrak. Get up and then go take a knee in the tank so we can get this shit going because I'm trying to actually finish saving you guys. I'm not done yet. And this is my favorite part of the story, right? Because Amtraks all have names painted on the side, right? They're like <laughs> tanks. They're like the crew oh God, what a name. funny name or a cool name or a badass name. Like Gene Lafayette Poole called his M4 Sherman tank in the mood. Well, this particular Amtrak that they loaded up all of the Catholic priests and nuns onto, on the other side of it, its name was, and I quote, the impatient virgin which is fucking uh, hilarious anyways, all the air jets get loaded up to maximum capacity and they take off so now we've got all the paratroopers and somewhere between five and six hundred of the healthiest looking internees available and they're gonna have to walk two miles over to the lake okay now cut back to the amtraks they're driving to the lake and they start taking fire from the tree line they can see the muzzle flashes off in the distance so one of the american soldiers in one of the amtraks is trying to get up to the 50 cal to return fire but there's so many internees in there and nobody's listening they're all cheering and talking and nobody can hear them he's telling people to move but they're not listening so he finally just literally gets on top and crawls over people to get onto this machine gun to start returning fire and this dude is just dumping ammunition everywhere in that general direction literally cutting down the trees that these people are firing from and finally when he quits seeing muzzle flashes he stops firing into this tree line and as the gun falls silent and the ringing in his ears finally goes away after a couple seconds he hears a baby crying and he looks down and there's an internee woman that was obviously starving to death and she was holding a three day old baby named Lois. And the baby was crying because one of the hot brass casings from the 50 caliber machine gun had fallen down and burnt this little three day old baby's face. And this American soldier's name was Dwight Clark felt like the biggest piece of shit on the planet because he had just burnt this little baby's face with a brass casing. But as sad as that is, everything works out as best as it possibly could because they get all of the internees across the lake, drop them off, turn back around, go pick up everybody else and bring them back safely. They got every single internee in Los Banos out of that camp. Okay, worth mentioning prior to this mission, the chain of command always sets parameters as to what's going to deem this mission a success. And this mission being successful was if they were going to be able to liberate one third of the internees and they got all of them unfortunately not everybody would get a happily ever after not the happiest among ending. the japanese soldiers that escaped in the first attack was sadaki konishi no! it's disappointed he fled made his way back to the Tiger Division, at which point later on in the coming days, he would convince the leadership of the Tiger Division to go back to the internment camp. And there was one village that was adjacent to it. And for whatever reason, he decided that that village should pay the price for his embarrassment because apparently they would have had something to do with it, surely, even though they really didn't. <laughs> More or less, the entire village was burnt to the ground and they killed everyone for the crime of simply existing near the site of their embarrassment, even though they had nothing to do with it. About a week later, American forces would win the Battle of Manila and they would continue to advance southward towards Los Banos where they had previously been and the 11th Airborne and the rest of the Allied forces would come face to face and see what the Japanese had done to that village because of their success during the Los Banos prison raid. For this, Sadaki Kanishi was captured, tried, and sentenced to death by hanging in- Oh my god. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. 1949 which unpopular opinion seems like far too quick of a yeah it really is. is that evil but i don't know maybe i'm a bad person but the good that came out of this was that over 2,000 internees that had been tortured and starved for over three years would finally get to return home and live happily ever after. The Sacred Eleven, the naval nurses that volunteered to go and help keep all of these people alive while also living under the same conditions were all awarded the Bronze Star and are highly regarded as heroes. The 11th Airborne Division got almost no break from the combat as they continued to finish clearing out the Philippines. The Raid of Los Banos is considered to be the most perfect airborne operation that has ever been executed and is deemed as a great success. Despite that, most of you have never even heard of it, and there's one simple reason for that. On the very same day as the Los Banos Raid, February 23rd, 1945, a group of Marines fashioned together a couple of drainage pipes and put the American flag on it and hoisted it over a battlefield where they were victorious at Iwo Jima. And when push came to shove, the newspapers decided to air the story that had the cooler picture. I'm gonna be honest with you guys, I have absolutely no idea how to end this video, so I'm just gonna end it with my favorite part. Fast forward to 1998, 43 years later, there's a woman by the 
name of Lois that gets a phone call seemingly out of the blue. She answers it, says hello, and it's an elderly man on the other line by the name of Dwight Clark. And he says, are you baby Lois from Los Banos? To which she replies, yes. And the next thing he says is, do you have scars on your face? This man fought through the Pacific in World War II. He has probably both seen and had to do horrific things to survive. And out of all of that, it has tormented this man for the past 43 years, knowing that he may have hurt a sweet, innocent little baby. And after that time, four decades, he finally finds out that she did not have any scars on her face. Approved. And that is probably the happiest ending with the most closure that I could yeah. possibly give you. So, thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Quack, bang, out. This is a really long video. Yeah, it really is. Oh, hey, real quick, uh, one more thing. If you guys want to know more about the 11th Airborne, there's a guy that actually specializes in it by the name of Jeremy Holm. He actually helped me out with this video. He's written three books on the subject and he has his own YouTube channel exclusively making content about the 11th Airborne. I'm going to have that link down below if you guys were interested. Other than that, I'm going to go get that beer now. See ya. See ya. Mr. Stanley Kingsbury, formerly General Manager of Trans-Pacific Trading Company, ex-Chief of Police and Fire Department of Los Banos Internment Camp. Mr. Kingsbury, would you describe in your own words your reaction to your liberation on February the 23rd? I went about my business, dressed, doing the regular duties in the room, when all of a sudden I heard the sound of planes very near, looked out of my cubicle, found first three planes came over one of the lower barracks. I noticed a white sheet drop out of one, I'd read a great deal about parachutes. I'd never seen them so near me before. All of a sudden, the nine planes were letting these parachutes out. It just seems that the air was filled with them. At that time, shooting began. Japanese bullets were flying thick and fast. Things were pretty hot there for about a half, three quarters of an hour. In the meantime, the boys who come in told us that we had to evacuate. And in the question of a few minutes, we were on the M tracks, where we rolled out of the camp, down to the shores of Laguna de Bay. That's the lake that was nearby, two kilometers away from the camp. I imagine, Mr. Kingsbury, that you felt as if the entire United States Army was dropping on your head when they started coming. I certainly did, and I even have to pinch myself now to realize that I am merely free and can talk and do as I please. You can do anything you want to, Mr. After Kingsbury. 1145 days under the Emperor from Japan, you can't realize how I feel. No, sir, I can't. Uh, I understand, Mr. Freeman, that you were wounded by a stray Japanese bullet during the liberation. Well, there really isn't much to say except bullets were flying right and left and we were so excited we didn't know what to do so tell me uh miss kramer what are your plans for the future i really don't know there's so many things i want to do that i can't make up my mind i need something to do well what do you want to say what do you want to do hmm? united, states. united states you mean you want to go back to the united states i'm nice to him okay <laughs> the camera's off right now you don't have to lie yeah what <laughs> i'm nice to him people right right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. give you everything you want because you're a prince everything no say hey guys just letting you know that i love my husband so much and uh, um I'm very <laughs> he gets treated very well <laughs> you're an idiot that's funny next i'd like to introduce uh, oh Charlie there's more Three sisters who helped making the lonely hours much happier. The Fernandez sisters. There were three little sisters, three little sisters who lived in Manila by the sea. Wow. Oh, no, this. I hope this isn't copyrighted. Oh. Yeah, I will let that continue, but I don't know if that, uh, that song in particular is copyrighted or not. If it isn't, that's that's amazing. Uh, anyways, yeah. Okay, yeah, that, that that was a video. Wow, this is gonna be a long one when I get back from work. Anyways, thank you guys for joining me today, and I'll see you all later. Goodbye. <laughs>